house. And my father were assigned an upper bunk. It had straw ticking. I am not sure whether you know, would you know what a straw ticking is? Yes, yes I do. It was just a burlap filled with straw. The uh, bolster was burlap filled with straw. And we had not eaten at that time, and we were not to get anything to eat. And then the next morning, a routine began uh, in, in earnest. And I do not know whether you want to ask me anything more. Yes, I've, please continue on about the, the routine now. What was the daily life? The routine was uh, that we had caps or we had hats. Most of us had some sort of a covering for our heads. And the first thing we knew that uh, these, the, the, uh, the civiliz civilization had come to an end was that uh, the barracks eldest took his stick and uh, lifted off hat of everyone that came in there, the hat of everyone that came in there. There was a piece of scalp went along with it, made no difference. Uh, then we saw a big sign, Mützen up or in block, which meant uh, hats off. In, in the barracks. Uh, the barracks was the, uh, the point where food was distributed and uh, uh, where things went on. We, in the morning, uh, we were issued, uh, we had still got a few cups and spoons or whatever it was, a, uh, uh, two slices of what the Germans call commisbrot, which means military bread, which was a mixture of uh, uh, wheat, rye, and uh, barley, perhaps. Uh, it was a very compact bread. Each one got two slices of bread, uh, sometimes a pat of margarine, sometimes a, a little bit of uh, marmalade. The coffee was, the coffee was uh, uh, toasted um, acorns ground up. Tasted terrible. And uh, at lunch, uh, for, for lunch or the midday meal, a soup with uh, maybe a little bit of meat. Potatoes was the main thing, and uh, the, uh, beets that you normally feed the cattle here. So this was our midday meal, and we started to get, we were already hungry in Terezin because we did not get enough to eat. In Auschwitz, it was worse. We were beginning to starve. In the evening, another slice of bread and uh, uh, some coffee, no marmalade, no butter, no nothing. In between, at the beginning, before we had coffee in the morning, we had then later on uh, what they, the Germans call appell stehen, which means, appell means counting, uh, the counting of the prisoners. We were arranged in groups of five with dis small distances between us. The uh, SS troop trooper would come by and start counting one, two, three, four by five and multiply by five. Uh, if he miscounted, he, he uh, went over it again. But meanwhile, we had stood out there already two hours because the, uh, uh, the uh, block eldest, uh, the block eldest, and the, the, the German uh, prisoners with their striped uniforms, we did not have striped uniforms. Uh, the German prisoners were uh, uh, beating us, well, not beating us that, at that time yet, but were getting us into line, sh rough shoving, punching, just to get us in line. Uh, so we were standing there an hour, two hours, and uh, I kept wondering why none of us uh, would overpower this lone guard who had just a small pistol. But what could we have done? There were guard posts on either end, high tension wires between with barbed wires and curved inward towards us. And uh, uh, we were as vulnerable uh, as anything. You could, we, we could have been killed. They, they needed simply to spray the entire place with machine gun fire and they would have gotten everyone in there. So apparently also there was no organization. There was no underground organization saying let's get together on this and let's see how we can uh, do this. It is, uh, I'm sure that most of the Americans have seen the Starlock series 
that were, they always overcome the, the Germans, but they actually did not. None of their schemes actually succeeded for very long, and I am sure that uh, in, in reading the, in, in, in viewing the uh, television series, what is it called again? Hogan's Heroes, is that the one? No, no, yes, that I meant the, where they always did, did well, but the other, the, the other one about the Holocaust, Lanzmann, Cloud Lanzmann, uh, was called Holocaust, wasn't it? Shoah. Shoah. Um, they uh, showed that actually only one or two people escaped out of the millions of prisoners in uh, Jewish prisons or prisoners in Auschwitz, and that is a very small amount. So we tried and s tried schemes to think of while in Auschwitz, none of us would have worked because only later on I saw why they would not have worked. They had what they called the Große Postenkette, or the Grand uh, Military Patrol, in small holes in the ground, camouflaged SS, were spaced 10 feet apart surrounding the entire camp, armed with machine pistols, with automatic rifles. Nobody would have come through. So. We gave that up and we de determined, well, we'll try and make, uh, try and survive. We did not yet know, and we did not know that uh, Auschwitz was an extermination camp or that we possibly uh, could be slated for extermination. The only thing that we did know was that there was always this sickly sweet smell and pallor in the air. We saw a crematorium belching smoke 24 hours a day. We saw uh, Red Cross wagons ferrying back and forth, and only later we found out that they were carrying uh, military personnel or cyanide ca canisters. We did not know that. Also, we were not permitted that close to the uh, entrance to the camp. So at any rate, all of a sudden, uh, we were made acquainted with brutality, which we did not think uh, a civilized nation like the Germans would either permit or n have knowledge of or do. The first one was that uh, at lunch, all of a sudden, a man was uh, taken, an older man, maybe 70, 65, 70, was taken and laid over the uh, central heating portion, which was just a, a rough chimney about, uh, I would say, about two foot, two and a half foot high. He was laid over that, held down by the German capo, they call them, the barracks elders and the work detail elders who were German criminals. And he received 15 cuts with a walking cane and I have never forgotten the screams or the pleas for mercy or later on no more, no, nothing anymore except the sounds that a dying animal would make. When they finally let him off, he could not stand and two fellow prisoners were ordered to support him. And a cardboard board a cardboard sign was hung, hung around his neck with a piece of string, and on it it said, Ich habe Brot gestohlen. I stole bread. We saw this many, many times. The man was, the, the older man, it could be anybody's grandfather, was totally destroyed. He was no longer a human being. Uh, mucus, snot, if you wish to call it, because that's what we called it. Snot ran down his face, his tears, his eyes streamed with tears. He was whimpering. We were fo <coughs> at any. <coughs> At any rate, we were acquainted all of a sudden what a German concentration camp was like. Did you have any contact with your family? Uh, yes, we saw each other. My mother's ha hair was cut down. She had long hair. My mother was a woman at that time of 
supporting, healthy, friendly. We saw, <coughs> at any rate, we saw each other. Uh, my father and my, my brothers uh, made the best we could of the situation. My uh, younger brother, who is now in Rome, Italy, had uh, secreted a work of a German poet. You may have known, no, you, you probably will know him, Goethe. He had written a work, Faust. We read it twice, we read it three times. Whereas in Theresienstadt we had some sort of a cultural life, we tried to make uh, Jewish culture our... There was a Zionist movement in, uh, in, how do we call it, in Theresienstadt. Mm -hmm. In Auschwitz there was nothing. It was the end, uh, the end of everything. We read the book, we memorized it, we quoted, we had a deck of cards that one of us had. We played uh, card games because there wasn't anything else we could do. Uh, my brother, out of sheer boredom, uh, got himself a job on uh, laying a uh, laying a uh, a stone uh, uh, Lagerstrasse, a, a, a cobblestone Lagerstrasse. It gave him a half a portion of food more. The, the work was excruciating. My mother uh, found that the nothing grew in uh, in Auschwitz. By the way, there was not a bird. There was not a living, no grass or something. So in order, there were some. Dra there was a drainage canal going through the uh, through our bee camp, and uh, daily uh, details of uh, prisoners from other camps came and laid sod. And my mother checked the sod over. We were desperate for food, and she found from our from living in our small village that there were items that we could eat out of there. And she gathered them, and uh, whenever we could see them, we uh, partook of them. But everybody was about as egotistical as there was no longer any uh, uh, sacrificing for anybody, even for family members, you couldn't. There wasn't enough to go around. A mother could not give of her portion for her starving child because there wasn't that much. We were actually starving. We were dreaming of food. We were talking about food. We were, uh, in, in three months of not having enough to eat, or four months, we were actually at the end of our strength. And yet we had hoped only that somehow in 1944 the end of the war would be in sight. We were also all of a sudden cognizant of the fact that we could all be very easily killed down there by machine gun fire from the watchtowers. And then in the middle of July, I remember news traveled through the camp. There was an upheaval in the German government and we have now a new minister of the interior. And we thought, oh, Something has happened. We were neither in Theresienstadt nor in Auschwitz able to obtain any news, rumors by the hundred thousands, not one bit of hard news. Uh, I do not know when the land, the landing may have already been uh, taken in, uh, uh, in, in Normandy in 1944. We were, not, we were not aware of it. We were totally and hermetically sealed off from the rest of humanity. Uh, the upheaval was, of course, the uh, assassination attempt of, uh, on Hitler on the 20th of July. And our hopes were dashed in the next three days when we found out that measures would be more stringent than, string, stringent than ever. And that the uh, person who had been chosen to head the entire interior ministry in Germany under which all the camps were was Heinrich Himmler himself. I'm sure that you have heard of Heinrich Himmler. And uh, uh, from one uh, plateau of hope, we were uh, again, how shall I say, dashed into an abyss of dismal, nearly dismal despair. And uh, yet again, we were hoping that eventually uh, we would be liberated. I had already, I had visions that we were 
return to, remember again that this is an, not a 65 year old person 66 year old person that it is a 16 year old person saying this to you we had i had visions that we would be hauled uh, not not hailed back in tri triumph to our respective places of where we came from and restored to all civilian honors and uh, recompense uh, recompense or compensation for what we had suffered uh, we heard artillery fire in the distance and we thought well these were the Russians advancing they may have well been uh, I do not know how far artillery fire and the detonations carry uh, we heard only that uh, the Russians were near Krakow uh, this again may have been a rumor we were not able to verify it nobody could tell us so that was Auschwitz uh, I Brutality, yes. Oh, one more thing that I wish to say. Uh, what did people die of? Well, they died of hunger because, because they ha had come to the camps with already with a, with, with a weakened composition. The corpses, and that was my first uh, Theresienstadt, I already knew well, the, the, the facts of life were abundantly clear that people died, and I knew that they were buried. But there, because there was no such nicest, niceties as a burial in a, in a coffin, the people who had died were thrown or stacked, is perhaps a better word, at the end of the very end of the barracks row, underneath the uh, watchtower, they were stacked like cordwood, naked, without dignity, as they had died, staring, unseeing, nobody to close their eyes, just like cordwood. Cordwood is four feet, as you remember, and that is how they were stacked, four feet high. Then at the end, towards the, uh, at every, every period, I think they were lying there several well, hours. I cannot remember. I, 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 I was not anxious to explore this uh, place of the dead, I did see it because I wanted to see it, uh, but every, I would say every 24 hours, a uh, cart came that had high uh, sides. They were, I know that because I saw it, they were simply hand and foot tossed on their dignity of the dead, nothing. And uh, we then knew that they were taken to the crematoria to be uh, incinerated. There is no good, no way to euphemistically describe this. We had still at that time no knowledge of the advent of the gas station, of the, of the gas chambers, and that people were killed or gassed in, uh, in, in such numbers uh, as they were. We only knew one more thing from uh, the, the transport that preceded us had some people in it, in it, and we talked about them to people that were in the B lager. Well, they told us then they were moved on such and such a date, and uh, they were del they deliberately did not tell us did not tell us that their fate was the gas chamber. It was we were deceived by all of us or by all of the people that were in the camp in any position to tell us we were deceived. They were perhaps told by the SS if anyone would ever talk about uh, gas chambers and crematoria, that their fate would, that that would be their fate. And they knew the Germans meant it. That they had been German trustees for 15 or 5 or 10 years meant absolutely nothing. If a German SS felt that uh, a prisoner, no matter what, was acting against rules, regulation, whatever it was, he felt no compunction to uh, pull his, put out his gun or to assign him to a, uh, to a gas chamber immediately, there and then. What were you doing in the camp? You nothing. Nothing? Absolutely nothing. Waiting. Rumor. Talk where we had been. Uh, talk uh, where we were born, talk of our experiences to others. Uh, we did not talk to the Czechoslovakian because we, did not, uh, we were not able to, commu to uh, communicate with them. I did not know but a few short words, a few sh 
a few words of uh, Czechoslovakian and some sentences. I did talk with the Dutch because I am, I, I am from a neighborhood that borders uh, uh, the, uh, the Netherlands. And our dialect was very close to uh, what the Dutch speak as their, natural na their national language. So with the Dutch, I could communicate. I, since I uh, made an effort to, uh, to learn their, their language, so I knew about uh, Westerbork, I believe, was the Dutch camp, and uh, the term undergedoken, which means uh, uh, dived under, uh, uh, meaning that somebody would uh, uh, take them in and hide them, a la Anne Frank, mm -hmm. uh, Anne Frank. Uh, that was because the Dutch were a kinder, a kinder people than the Germans. So we were waiting. That we were in pens did not occur to us. I must say this again and again. We had no inkling, no notion of what awaited us there. The only reason that I and my oldest brother got out is a bombing raid on a factory in uh, nearby Dresden, which was manufacturing gasoline from uh, bituminous coal. It had been badly damaged by Allied bombers, and all of a sudden we were called out, my brother and I. Uh, he was 19, I was 18, or was not. I was 19, he was 20. We were still in good physical condition, and we were told that we were to be shipped off to a, a camp where we would do work in the, in the German industry. This was 1944? 1944, August probably. I cannot, we didn't have a calendar. It had to be August somewhere around, around that, beginning of August, let's say. It was shortly after the uh, assassination attempt. <clears throat> My brother and I were told to report to a barracks um, somewhat closer to the entrance. Uh, we were assigned two bunks. And uh, we were told, uh, you people are going, there will be a transport together of about 2,000 uh, men. You are going to go to such and such a town, uh, or to a town near Dresden, where you will do work for the uh, German war industry. We did not know what to believe at that time. We hoped that it, it was the right thing, as again, we had no thoughts of death chamber. The only thing that disturbed me was uh, my mother came, sneaked into our barracks. It was strictly against the rule. Everybody was assigned to a barracks after 9 o'clock. Nobody was to leave the barracks under death penalty. My mother came and said, She took leave of us. <laughs> we, try <coughs> we tried to uh, figure out a way how to get together again after this on spot. The best I can, <coughs> the best I can tell you. And I finally had, she said, let me stay with you. I said, no, you know, they don't, they don't allow it. You only get yourself into more difficulty. Please go. So, <laughs> She left. Well, <coughs> the next day, early in the morning, we still had our civilian clothes. My brother and I were taken. We thought now that this was going to be our end. Finally dawned on us 
that this might really be the end, that they were going to get rid of all the able-bodied people in order to have no resistance from the women, children, and older people. But no, we marched by the crematorium, and that was the first time I had seen the crematorium. There was no activity going on except that uh, the, the uh, chimney was belching the blackest soot that I had ever seen. The stench was almost impossible to bear. And we were taken to a low-lying barracks where we were told to undress completely, and we thought that this was going to be the end. Uh, we kept our shoes on. They asked us to. Uh, they told us you may keep your shoes. I had a small knife, and I don't know what else I had. A little, some token that I had been given from a girl in Theresienstadt. I had hidden it in my shoes, but they had taken care of that. Our shoes were disinfected. Some. A Polish prisoner in striped uniform was there. He had a basin, and we had to walk through this basin, and he took our shoes before we entered this shallow basin, and he, uh, he sh shook out the shoes and beat them together, and I could uh, see that he was bringing up coins and, and valuables that people had tried to hide, and uh, we were given our shoes back. Our next station was a barber. We were relieved of, or we were shorn of all of our body hair, completely bald, our underarm hair, our pubic hair, everything was shorn off. Every body hair was totally shorn off, and we were given the striped uniform that you have, I'm sure you have seen uh, many times, and we had uh, on these striped uniforms, we had sewn on uh, the numerals and the uh, insignia that we had already seen in the camp, but uh, and we had been explained what it was: uh, black for German uh, uh, professional criminals, uh, green for uh, uh, for other uh, criminals that were not professionals but had just uh, run afoul, murderers or something like that, that had been uh, given. Uh, uh, penitentiary sentences, uh, perverts, everyone had a uh, different insignia. I remember one uh, group that I found later were the homosexual, the pink triangle, you may have heard of it. And then when I looked at uh, oh, political prisoners, the uh, elite of the camp, the carpos, the uh, eldest, the, bl the block eldest and the work detail eldest, uh, had their low numerals like 642 with a red triangle. We knew that they had been in since 1934-35. Our numbers were uh, stenciled on there in black, uh, in black ink, uh, preceded by a yellow triangle resting on its base and a red triangle superimposed to form a Star of David. Uh, my number was 85,501. My brother was, uh, was the oldest brother, and he was uh, first in, with initials also. His number was 85,500. We were loaded into cattle cars. We had nothing to sit on. We had lost a lot of weight, and we were sitting on our bare, uh, on our bare bones on our behind. Uh, be because that's what we were told. The railroad cars were locked, um, as I had told you before. We had to march to the railroad siding, which was a different siding than what we, excuse me, than what we arrived on, and that is where we saw the Große Postenkette, which was whenever there was a transport arriving or a transport leaving, uh, the the uh, guard the guards were situated eight to 10 feet apart from each other, or 10 to 15 feet, I cannot recall now, each one in a small hole in the ground, uh, barely, uh, I do not know why they had the hole in the ground business, but that is where they were. Maybe they had a seat down in there where they could sit down, uh, and we are just visible above the ground. So at any rate, we passed this uh, one after one after one, and they were all in camouflage units and uh, uh, 
uh, finally, I think I, I, we, we passed about 15, 20 of these till we arrived at the wash barracks. So there we were in the railroad cars and we were being transported. We could not see out because the railroad cars were totally dark. We had no tools to break the cars open. The planks were heavy, so we gave that up. And, uh, well, finally we arrived. We arrived, we did not know this, but the numbers that we were given were assigned to us by a concentration camp called Sachsenhausen Oranienburg. And the camp that we were in was called Schwarzheide. Black Heath was the, was the, is the translation. It had been a labor camp for prisoners. The barracks were there. Everything was in pretty good order. And uh, uh, we had, again, the guard troops that accompanied us. We did not know this until we left the, the railroad train. They had uh, Pullman accommodations uh, right behind the locomotive. They apparently, there was no need to uh, shoot past the railroad cars because uh, there was no opening in there, there was no window, no nothing. It was just uh, totally uh, enclosed cars. So we saw then the, the Pullman cars and we were driven to a, an assembly place and uh, arranged in the ordinary five or groups and marched to the camp from the railroad siding, which was about four or five miles distance. And uh, we knew that we were in Germany because some of the inscriptions were in German. We finally arrived at that. There were no electric uh, 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 barbed wire fences this time, but there were uh, the barbed wire fences that were double, triple concertina wire uh, with, with guard posts, nevertheless, in guard houses above. And uh, we were given nothing to eat, we were given nothing to drink. We were fairly much dying from thirst till finally the camp turned on the water faucet and we nearly killed each other trying to get something to drink. We were, I mean, we had not had anything to eat or to drink since the night before from Auschwitz. So there we were assigned then barracks. I think my, my barracks was barracks number two. And I, I, of course, was with my brother. And uh, we were there two days to, uh, uh, to, uh, to be assigned bunks. And uh, bunks were, again, with straw ticking and uh, uh, cleaning of the barracks and work details, uh, cleaning out the latrine. Uh, and then we were told the facts of life. This camp is such and such. When you must go at night to the latrine, you must announce yourself to the guard. Uh, uh, what was the uh, formula? Uh, Wache, which means uh, uh, guard, uh, uh, guard on duty, one prisoner to the toilet. And uh, you had to wait a moment. He did not acknowledge it. But then you moved in this, the, the, the camp was floodlit at night. You moved then to the toilet, and I suppose they kept track of how many people were in there. But uh, always this indignity of, uh, of having to, to announce your, your destination, so to speak. Uh, I do not, I, I cannot tell you anything except the routine was uh, unloading bricks without any nourishment whatsoever was, if anything, even less, I believe. Later on, it was established that we got approximately uh, the equivalent of 700 to 800 calories a day at a job a, a requirement of, let's say, 2,500 at minimum to 3,000 calories. Unloading a railroad car, uh, the uh, details were marched out of the camp at the entrance to the factory we were split off. Three or four SS troopers took us and marched us to the, 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 our detail to the place where we were unloading bricks from a railroad car and stacking them up. And of course, none of us was uh, uh, geared to this kind of work. Our hands were bloodied. The first nine we had already blisters, and we still were forced uh, to um, to. Uh, how do we call it, to, to perform this work. 
the brutality there was quite simple. The SS at that, at that place, the guard troopers, had uh, rifles, like our M1 rifles here in the United States, and they would just take their rifles and beat on the back, on the head, uh, not the face, apparently. They, need, they, they fig figured out that if they uh, knocked our eyes out, they wouldn't be able to work at all. So they concentrated on the back, mostly. Uh, the other job was uh, concrete works, uh, carrying iron uh, reinforcement rods, uh, carrying cement bags. Uh, at, at lunch, some, some food was brought out from the, from the camp. And the only reason that occasionally I got some, some additional food was that some people, they were, the, the Germans had some mussels, or not oysters, but mussels, some shrimp things. And there were quite a few observing, observant Jews yet amongst us, religious, really religious person, and they perceived that this was really and truly against their religion. So they decided not to eat it, and I was able to get occasionally a few bowls of soup more, mainly because people didn't, uh, couldn't, did not, did choose not to eat, eat it. So life was like that until uh, one day I was working in an underground bunker. I found a German foreman's lunch pail. Uh, right or wrong, I took it and ate it. I was so hungry, I ate it. I stole this man's lunch and I ate it. And I was also so decimated at that time, I fell asleep down there at, on this job. I, I just could not, I could no longer go on. I fell asleep down there. Unfortunately, this was the time that the SS had chosen above ground to assemble our group to, to take us to another uh, workstation, and I was missing. They could not have been very long there, and uh, I ran to my place, but unfortunately, I was discovered by one of the SS men and said, where are you coming from now? And I said, I was in the un underground bun bunker. He says, we called everyone together. You did not hear. And he started to really uh, lay it into me with his rifle butt. And I dragged myself that evening back to camp. And uh, my name had been reported, and I had to... Uh, undergo another beating from this particular man. Uh, the, uh, the camp uh, inmates called him Peitsche, which means a whip, Rakosi or something like that in, in Czechoslovakian. And uh, he really uh, beat me nearly senseless. So I started to bleed out of my mouth. So then he gave up. Nevertheless, I had to stand at that uh, uh, what's called punishment uh, stand, standing. I did not get anything to eat that night. And, uh, and since I was still continuing to bleed, uh, they took me to what they called uh, uh, the, 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 the well, hospital or the Krankenstation. Sick Bay would be the, be the best translation of this in, in Germany. They took me to Sick Bay, which was staffed by one of the finest doctors in Europe, because in order to get out of, out of work, they had only uh, university professors, medical university professors there as doctors. An ordinary doctor didn't even get in, you know, a family practitioner. So at any rate, uh, I do not know what they diagnosed. They kept me there. Uh, something, some internal organ must have uh, ruptured. Uh, I don't know what they gave me, but after a while, the bleeding stopped. And uh, but they still kept me on that station until about. Uh, and I had a little bit better uh, luck in there. I still saw my brother daily, who would come to visit me and talk to me on on, on the window. And uh, he told me what uh, he was, uh, what was going on with uh, with the, the camp, and uh, I could share no food with him, and he could share no food with me. We were all starving, and in this barracks that I sh 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 I shared with the others, our constant thought was nothing but food, 
food, food. We talked of nothing. We dreamt of nothing. Uh, we couldn't. The food was constantly on our mind, and it, it was one of the greatest tortures that I have ever undergone. Undergone because from then on, this talk about food did not cease until I finally got out of the concentration camp. At the, uh, the, the camp itself was bombed severely on my birthday, on the 23rd of August, a bombing attack that was actually destined for the camp. The camp was fog shrouded by artificial fog, <laughs> and the British bombed us instead. And the barracks were destroyed, and some 87, 90 people were, were losing their life, and they were bringing them to the hospital. And the doctors were operating what they could, and the severed limbs were lying in front. It was, it was carnage. But by that time, I probably I was already somewhat inured, if is that the right pronunciation, to these sites. And I do not recall having greatly uh, uh, been agitated by it. It was terrible. Yes, it was. It was it were Jewish people that were being killed, but we had seen so much already, and we had lost so much already in our life that we did not put any more import to this particular uh, situation. So, would you like to ask me a question that I may have not well, uh, answered? When did you get out of the hospital? I never did get out of the hospital because my I was still weakened and uh, still not. Uh, I got around with difficulty. I will only uh, tell you one more thing, uh, and uh, I, I beg you to understand it. Um, the hospital orderly, a German who happened to have been also from Cologne, uh, tried to practice sodomy on me. I knew, of course, I was 19 years old. I knew that these things were done. He asked me to take his penis in my mouth and, as we call it now, suck him off. I did it because I was totally concerned with my own survival, and I knew that I would be uh, rewarded with additional food. I know it's degrading, <laughs> but tell me what isn't, what wasn't degrading in that, in that respect. He tried to, uh, he, I said he tried to practice sodomy on, on me, but uh, he was unable because uh, my body was perhaps not built that way, because he was uh, overly large. He was a little bit unhappy about that. He tried several times more. I was one of the younger prisoners. Uh, there were not very many people younger than I. And, uh, well, he did not do this any more than about three or four times that I recall. And the beginning, the end of August, beginning of September, we were told that those of us in the hospital would we move to another camp where we were to be evaluated for uh, uh, work, uh, how shall I say, capability to work, or other means? And uh, a friend of mine whom I had known from Cologne and five or six other people were transported through Germany. The trip took something like about six or seven hours. The SS was sitting with us in the Camion, the German word or the Polish word was camion. It actually was just what we call uh, a six by six. Uh, uh, how do you call that? Uh, a, well, a, a military. Uh, 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 just a, a, cell? a truck. Okay. No, it was a oh, truck, oh. an ordinary military truck. But it had a canopy over it, and the guards were sitting there. The canopy was closed, but the guards were there at the, uh, at the tailgate and they were sitting there with machine pistols. And so we made it into Liberose, and uh, we were uh, given over to the, to the camp where there were already the block eldest that took us into uh, custodianship and assigned us 
two blocks. My block was block number two. I had a big fat German by the name of Arno. He had been a political prisoner since uh, he was a communist, apparently, but that did not uh, prevent him from really putting it, uh, pu uh, putting rank on us or uh, totally making our lives one hell there. The commission actually did come out, and there were doctors from, uh, military doctors from Sachsenhausen, then they did determine. And I did not know what to, to do, and I told them that I had uh, actually been sent over there because they could not diagnose what my ailment was, that it was a, uh, it, it seemed to have to stabilized into a, uh, a cold, more or less, that I seemed not to be able to, to, to shake. And I was told to uh, go, to stand aside. My friend had the presence of mind to tell these doctors that really we were there for, uh, that we were capable of working, but they wanted to be sure that uh, this was diagnosed properly because they did not have uh, German doctors at this camp. And that is why we were sent to Liberose. The camp's name was Liberose. And uh, that we were there truly for evaluation. And he asked him, well, can you two work? And uh, he said, yes, we can work. We are, we are capable of working. He said, OK, we assign you to barracks number one, report there also for work detail. So this is what happened. He actually had saved my life, because the rest of the people that were there were what we called Muslim. Have you heard that term? A Muslim is Muslim. I do not know how the term got started, but it were the people that you have probably seen in totally this wrecks of human beings, no cheeks, cheekbones, uh, uh, no arms, no buttocks, uh, sticks for legs, barely able, barely able to, uh, uh, to move about. These were called in the camps Muslim. And uh, the transport, transport was put together early in the time in Liberose. They, whether they made it back to Auschwitz, because Auschwitz already was there on the verge of being evacuated, uh, whether they did or did not, I cannot tell. Uh, I at least worked some five, six months in Liberose until finally the Russians came, approached. And our work over there were digging tank ditches in, uh, in the fields over there. And again, we uh, were subjected not so much of, uh, by harsh or brutal treatment by the SS uh, guards, but by those who should have had a, f uh, a fellow feeling, a sympathy for us, namely the um, German capo. Have you heard that term before? Mm -hmm. The capos treated us ill to the nth degree. The, everyone had the ever-present walking stick, and uh, if we didn't move fast enough, uh, he seemed to think that he was responsible that the work pensum was done. And uh, if we didn't work fast enough, well, then he started to beat us. Generally, again, on the back, we were all, our attitude was mostly this, trying to protect our heads and our faces. Well, one day, he beat my friend so severely that he finally, he was a, a, a guy from Saxony, a short fellow against a, a, a political prisoner. He beat both of us so <laughs> terribly that uh, uh, we told our block elders that we had to go to the uh, sick bay because we needed some attention. Well, he apparently must have felt, since we were German Jews, he must have felt some sort of not compassion or maybe maybe a spark of compassion, we were the next day assigned to the potato kitchen. And uh, there we could sit down and peel, peel potatoes. And from there we rested, uh, we stayed in the, potato, in the potato kitchen and did not have to work quite so hard anymore. And our jobs was just that. And uh, we were sitting and we were talking again about old times and food and this and that and trying to eat raw potatoes. But as probably everybody knows by now, there is not very much value in raw potatoes because the starch has not been converted to a, uh, an absorbable substance 
that the, the substance, the, the only thing that we uh, uh, was forbidden is to take one single potato or one single potato peel out. And we were daily searched, but in a manner that was unusual. We had our our uh, basic, uh, our food, our lunch pail, a, a cup and a, a fork, and uh, the uh, the guy that searched us was a deaf mute, also a political prisoner. He was a Polish prisoner, and I can remember vividly we walked out there like that, our lunch pail over there, our cup in that hand, and he would go uh, under our uh, our jackets, feeling the pockets, feeling between our legs, uh, lifting up our shoes. Uh, to, to see uh, whether we had secreted any, uh, any uh, uh, potatoes. And if, uh, if we did, well, that was the end of that person's potato duty in the warm kitchen. And Germany's gotten pretty cold there in the, uh, in the wintertime. Besides that, he, he got a, such a beating from the capo and was turned over to the Strafkolonne, or punishment uh, detail. They, were, they wore big red uh, patches, blood red patches on their backs and had especially hard detail. I never did get on that detail and I was very thankful for that. So that was the potato field. And there is also where I found, this was now concentration camp in the German manner. It had nothing to do with death camp. And there again the brutality was carried to the extreme to the flogging or the caning. Uh, again, we had to stand out for hours in rain, in sunshine, in, in heat, standing on our place, not being able to move, uh, just shifting around a little bit from one foot to the other and standing. It was such a punishment. Uh, we didn't know what they wanted from us. Then they announced over the uh, loudspeaker that such and such had uh, transgressed, I don't know what he'd done, maybe sabotage something, he didn't walk fast enough, or he dropped a, buck, uh, a, a bag of cement which spilled out and caused the German government uh, uh, um, the damage beyond compare, and that he, that he was to receive, and this was in, in legal, it was read by the, by the camp commander that uh, Therefore, the Reichsführer SS, uh, Heinrich Himmler, has decreed that he is to receive uh, 25 Stockhebe or cane lashes on the naked behind, on the, uh, of the nackten Arsch, naked buttocks, at the next uh, uh, appell, appell is, was the name of, of uh, standing out there. And they had a special, um, that camp had a special uh, device where uh, they have laid the, it, it was like a lectern, a crude big lectern with an incline on it, and two prisoners held his hands over the lectern, and two other prisoners held his legs, and the camp, uh, Kleiderkammer, what is that word again, the, where, where the clothing was distributed. Another German capo, a, uh, a political, not a political, a Schwerverbrecher, a um, uh, professional criminal who was well nourished, laid the best he could on there because he wanted to make sure that the camp commanders saw that he was taking his work seriously. And uh, the ignominy of it was that the poor guy that was to be, uh, that was being flogged had to count the strokes uh, ostensibly by, <coughs> by the camp commander's order that he should be sure to receive only that which the Reichsführer had decreed and not one more or not one less. And these poor people had to, uh, uh, while they were screaming and begging for mercy, and uh, uh, letting loose of their body fluids had to count one, two, three. By the time they were at 10 or 15, nobody, uh, none of them could at that give any more sound except maybe a whimper. And for them, the camp eldest was then forced to count until the, uh, 
until the punishment was completed. They had also one thing, and uh, we were not allowed to close our eyes. They walked through the ranks, our own carpus walked through the ranks, and laid, uh, I mean, they, with their, they had short sticks, and they beat us unmercifully if we closed our eyes during these, uh, these, um, oh, how do you call them, uh, the corporal punishment sessions. And that camp also had its own portable gallows. And some poor soul, I don't know what it was, it wasn't a Jew, it may have been a Pole, had tried to escape. And uh, for that, uh, normally Saturdays and Sundays, we had uh, some time off to clean up. Sa Saturdays we worked till 10, 10 o'clock. Saturday evening was given to cleaning the barracks. Clean. But that, those Saturdays, or at least that one Saturday that I remember, was uh, it was very uh, a very simple affair. It was uh, just two poles with a crossbar and a bench on there. Uh, the guy's hands were tied behind his back. As I said, he again had this decree of the Reichsführer as S. Heinrich Himmler was read out that now therefore I decree that you shall be hanged by the neck. And uh, the camp was something like five to 8,000 people or 10,000 people. We did not know where it occurred, what he had done. We only were confronted with the fact that our Saturday afternoon was again, when we needed to rest so badly, it was again taken. I'm not sure whether I felt a certain resentment, maybe I did, that uh, he was the cause of our, of our loss of sleep or whatever it was. But anyhow, it was over, luckily, very quick for the man. He was simply, since they had tied his hands and feet, he was simply, he had a rope tied around his neck. His hands and feet were tied. Two of the strong German carpos just simply lifted them, lifted them on, on, on the bench. The Kleiderkammer guy, this uh, clothing uh, chamber uh, capo, uh, simply tightened the rope, and uh, the other two guys just kicked the bench away. And all I can say is I hope that his end was quick. It was not. It was the first one that I witnessed, but it was not the last. Uh, I wouldn't say ex yeah execution or a willful. Uh, killing of German guards, of Jews, or other prisoners. This was the way he ended, and for added measure, we were forced to march by the execution place slowly, and we were forced to look at it. We were forced, like, uh, I, like in, later on in the American army, eyes right. And by golly, we had to, to, to see this sorry, sorry spectacle. I'm not sure whether, as I said before, I cannot tell you whether I feel pity. By that time, pity was a word that had been expunged from our dictionaries. We had no longer pity except for ourselves. That was Liberosa at night. We had a stove in the, in, in, in the barracks, and at night uh, we had a bucket where we had to urinate. The urination was uh, in the barracks because it was sub-zero temperature, and you could hear the prisoners uh, utilize this bucket. It was loud and noisy, and uh, we had to carry that outside and empty it outside. And I believe me, the buckets were always over full and much as we tried to avoid getting splashed by urine, it never happened because we had no food, so therefore we drank. The only thing that was available to us was water. We developed edemes because the water settled in our knees. We had difficulty, all of us, no, except of course the well-fed German carpos. We still were working on, on details, digging ditches, unloading, um, unloading uh, cement bags, whatever it was. One of the, it was bitterly cold, 
And one of our ways of trying to shield ourselves against the cold, we had exactly what one small thin jacket, our prison jacket, and one, uh, one undershirt. And in the bitter cold, we had no socks, we had no gloves. We tried to steal the paper bags and place them between us, between on our backs and our front, to have some insulation. That was strictly forbidden, and we, I was beaten severely for having this under my jacket. The only, the only way they found that is when we entered the camp after our work detail, they sometimes made body controls to feel whether we had secreted something, discovered that I had a cement bag, an empty bag, the paper bag on me. That earned me no food that day and a beating and standing at the gate with several others who had the same or had committed the same offense. At night, in, instead of going to sleep, we, the Jews, were chosen to guard a wood pile because there was very little firewood. The other barracks tended to steal this. To avoid this, we were forced to stand outside in this bitter cold in the snow and guard our wood pile. And I cannot tell you what thoughts I had I, I had many, many thoughts to think of. Many of them were about what religion was doing to us, what religion was doing for us, why we were not being liberated, why the entire world, and this is, has occurred to us many times, why, why we seemed to have been forgotten or why we were indeed forgotten by the entire world, why we had no sign of anything the German population kept very much away from us because we were described as the lowest of the low criminal em event. We had no pity or sympathy from them at all. What else is there to say? Uh, we, we stayed in that camp and uh, on, in, on one of the highlights, you must know now how desperate we were, one of the highlights was a German civilians fleeing from the Russians made it as far as the camp and their horse died. And our cooks went out and got the horse and carved him up and f put a soup together and some stew. And we had for the first time meat. One horse didn't go very far for 8,000 prisoners, but they used everything. And uh, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm sure that by that time all the religious Jews decided to eat what came their way. Even they did know that there was uh, horse meat in there, it made no longer very much of a difference. You ate because you had to hope for the next day. You had to get through that one day. So again, 